Hi, I'm Kubis van Rensburg. Join me now for Capturing Glory. We're going to go into the Word of God. We can now all come boldly to the very throne of God, which is the real mercy seat. Jesus talking, he says it in Matthew 2, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, you know, he had a lot of discussions with the Pharisees, it was normally not a good conversation, on their part it was normally bad, you know, from Jesus' side it was normally good, and Jesus said, you make the word of God of no effect, because of the traditions that you cling to. So, this word is powerful. I mean, everything is made by the word. You know, we believe, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, we believe that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 says, He upholds everything by the power of His word. So, God's word is powerful, you know. When Jesus came and He drove out the demons and calmed the storms and healed the sick the people said what manner of man is this his word is with power so there's a lot of power in this word but if you cling to your traditions you can make the word of no effect so you can cancel the word if you hold fast to traditions if martin luther didn't stand up 500 years ago we would all be in purgatory so There are people that still believe that stuff because they didn't take the word that Martin Luther brought. Years later, the Baptists came and they said, actually, you must be baptized. But the people that are Lutherans still don't baptize because their traditions said, you know, you must be sprinkled. Then, you know, years later, the Pentecostals came around and they said, you can now you can speak in tongues now. And the Baptist says, no, you just need to order baptism. So they stayed behind. Then the Charismatics came and said, well, you know, it doesn't matter which church you're in, you can be filled with the Holy Ghost. Right? So every now and then God moves on and he's trying progressively to teach us more about the revelations of his word. But if we hold fast to our traditions, we'll make the word of no effect. How is it that there are people that have supernatural signs, wonders and miracles and there are people that are so hungry, but they never see a miracle? How is it there are people, you know, they need finances and they just don't get breakthroughs and there are other people that's flowing in money? Hmm? You make the word of no effect because of your traditions. Say, I'm ready to be shaken. The Bible says, all that can be shaken will be shaken, and only that which can remain shall remain. Okay? So, uh, God will shake from time to time the church so that what cannot be shaken, that means everything that's on the foundation will stand the test of time. So when God made man, Adam and Eve, in his own likeness and in his own image, he made them to live forever and ever. Man was created to live forever. So, God said, you can eat of all the trees that's in the garden, except of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, because in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. 
Then Satan came along and he said, Is it true that God said? So they believed Satan, so now they're supposed to die. Okay? Before that, they were not supposed to die. Hmm? So here comes Almighty God and he says, Take an angel with a flaming sword to guard the way to the tree of life. So God said, let's protect the tree. Let's protect the tree of life. In verse 24 of Genesis 3, it says, So that man will not eat of this tree and live forever and don't die. Okay? Let's protect the tree with a flaming sword so that man will not eat of this tree and live and never die. Actually, from verse 22, 23, 24 of Genesis chapter 3. Okay? Now, in Zechariah chapter 13, there's a prophecy. The prophecy says the following, Awake, O sword, awake, O sword, and slay the shepherd. Okay? That scripture is fulfilled in Matthew 26 at the crucifixion of Jesus. It says, as it is written, awake, O sword, and slay the shepherd. Okay? So the sword that protected the tree of life is now alive and awake to do something, to slay the shepherd. So what will happen if the shepherd is slain? So we've got to pick that up in Isaiah 53, verse 5 and 6. He says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. With His stripes we are healed. Verse 6 says, We all like sheep have gone astray, but now have come back. Okay? So back to Zechariah 13 and Matthew 26. Awake, O sword, and slay the shepherd, so that the sheep will be scattered. So the night the Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, everybody ran away. I mean, the only people that stayed behind was Mary and John. Okay, the, the Bible says all his loved ones stood afar off. I mean, Peter was hiding, James was hiding, but John stood there by the cross with Mary. So that Jesus said, Mother, behold your son, son, behold your mother. That's the only two people that were his people at the cross. The rest ran away. So the sheep were scattered. But after the shepherd was slain, he said, now we all can come back. Amen. Okay? Where do we come back to? So, uh, uh, you know, Hebrews 13 says, we all come back to the shepherd of our souls. Okay? So the sword that protected the tree of life has now awoken, slain the shepherd to make sure that all the sheep can come back. Come back to what? To the tree of life. Um, okay? So if we eat of this tree, we shall live and never die. So Revelation chapter 2, the Lord Jesus appears unto John on the Isle of Patmos. And he said to them that overcome, I will give to eat of the tree of life. Okay? So can we now eat of the tree of life? Yes. So what will happen if we eat of the tree of life? Just answer me. You shall live and never die. Okay? So he says, those that eat of this tree will live and never die. Okay, so if I eat of the tree of life, I will live and never die. I will live and never die. Die. So God's idea was for man to live forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. So uh, now death is stepping in because of Adam and Eve's treason, their offenses, their sin that they fall into. And so now man is supposed to die. In Genesis chapter 6, you know, man is now going from 900 to 800 and the years become gradually less and less and less and less. Till the days of Noah, and in Genesis 6 it says, you know, sin increased on the earth and God said, all flesh have now sinned. My spirit will not abide with them forever, but yet their days shall be 120. Yet. So, uh, yet can mean a lot. 120 years. Okay? So, all of a sudden, man lived forever. 
Man ate the tree, now man is supposed to die. So man goes down from living forever to 900 years, 800, and slowly the years become gradually less and less and less. Till the days of Noah where God says, you know, uh, as from today, I'm going to kill everybody because everybody has now sinned. My spirit's going to go away from them. And, but yet, their days, in other words, the people that lived in the days of Noah, they shall live another 120 years. Why? Because it took Noah 120 years to build the ark. So after 120 years, God destroyed everybody except Noah and his family. So now, man is not supposed to live 120 years. It's that only there will be another 120 years in the days of Noah. Okay? Then, years later, Moses came around. So he led the children of Israel out of Egypt. In the desert, the children of Israel are very stubborn, hard-headed, stiff-necked, unbelieving. They don't take the word of God. And God says they're all going to die in the wilderness. So uh, they are in the wilderness for 40 years. A generation was accounted for 40 years in Bible days. God says, this generation shall not see the promised land. Which generation? The unbelieving generation. But there was a generation that believed. Who were they? The people that believed the word of Joshua and Caleb. Okay, so Moses comes and he writes Psalm 90. He says, Oh God, the people die in the wilderness. The strong ones become 70 and the very strong ones become 80. Okay, he didn't say we're supposed to be 70 and 80. He says, in the wilderness, they are all dying. And those that were young are becoming 70. The strong ones, 80. He says, oh God, but this is not a good thing. So the 120 years is not a year that you can reach. 120 is the years in the days of Noah that was left before the flood. 70 and 80 is the years for the unbelieving people in the generation of unbelief in the desert. So that's not what you're supposed to be, and that's not what you're supposed to be. But you are supposed to live and never die. Okay? But because everybody died. Yes, because the Bible says all have sinned, and now short of the glory. And as in one man's offense all have died... So by the obedience of one, we shall all be made alive. That is Romans 5 and verse 17 says, and we shall reign in life in one Christ Jesus. In other words, we shall have life. And if we believe the price that Jesus paid, we shall have life because of the obedience of Christ. And we will reign in life. In other words, we will reign in life. So death will not have any hold on us. Okay, all that to start our message today, the, they make the word of God of no effect because of their traditions. Okay, here comes the tradition. It's time for the invitation. The meeting is now finished. And we have preached the fire down. Everybody is sitting under conviction. People are feeling condemned and judged and ready to burn in the flames of hell. Because we have preached. And now we're going to give an invitation to save them from hell. And this is how, while the music plays, every eye closed, every head bowed, nobody looks around. Tradition. It's not in the Bible. So it's a man-made thing. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Tradition, it's not godly. There's nothing Bible in that. Point number one. Point number two. If you are in this place tonight, and you want to go to heaven when you die. Point number two. Not scriptural. Nothing in the Bible that says, if you want to go to heaven, put up your hand. <laughs> Point number three. If you die tonight, where will you spend eternity? 
tradition. Point number four. If you die, what will you say to Jesus? Why must he allow you in heaven? Tradition. If you die, okay, so our invitation, our invitation is death. If you die tonight, are you ready to face death? Prepare to meet your God. We preach life for a full hour. Then we challenge people with death to meet the Lord Jesus Christ. But the Bible says the last enemy to be conquered is death. So death is an enemy and we present it like a friend. If you die, are you ready to meet God? So all the invitations that I've ever heard are unscriptural. John chapter 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Come on, you help me. That whosoever believeth in him should... Okay, you quote it like you don't believe it. So... God sent His Son that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but ever. Not perish. Do you want another word for perish? Corrupt and decay. So it says, anybody that believes in me shall not be corrupted. Shall not go into decay. Okay, what happens if a body dies? It decays. It gets corrupted. Okay, shall I just throw it in? 1 Corinthians 15 says the last enemy to be conquered is death. We all know that. So death is an enemy. Is death an enemy? I'll prove it to you. We preach death like it's an everyday friend. Oh, when you die tonight, are you ready to die? Are you ready to go to heaven? Are you ready to meet your maker? Then somebody phones us and one of the congregation members is busy dying. This guy is 104 years old. He's got TB, lung cancer, and sugar diabetes. So we go there to Uncle Jack that is about to die. What do we pray for? Oh God, just give him a few more days. Why must he get a few more days? I mean, he lived his whole life for this purpose, to die one day. This whole life has been lived to die one day and go to heaven. Because heaven is the ultimate goal. But when it's time to die, we pray for them to live. Why don't we pray for everybody to die? Everybody that wants to go to heaven, this line up. We're going to pray for you tonight to go to heaven. Heaven, 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 heaven. We set you free. Go to heaven, go to heaven. Have you ever seen such insanity of getting people ready to die? But our preaching is aimed at death. Our preaching is aimed at heaven. Now tell me the scripture that says we're going to go to heaven. Where's the scripture that says you must die and go to heaven? But our invitation is if you die tonight, are you sure that you're going to heaven? And it's not a scripture. So 1 Corinthians 15 says, you know, 
I know it talks about there, verse 45, the rest of the scripture, 46, 47, 8. And it says, as we bore the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. The first man, Adam, was out of the earth earthy. The second man is the Lord of heaven. So we're supposed to have the image of the Lord Jesus, not the image of Adam. Because in Adam all died, but in Christ all is made alive. So you want to decide, are you still in Adam? Then you're going to die. But if you are in Christ, you're supposed to be made alive. Then it says, but at the sound of the trumpet. Now the trumpet is not, there's not going to be an angel flowing around earth, blowing a trumpet. Papa, 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 papa. No, no, no. Trumpet is prophetic announcements. Okay, if you go to the Bible at the sound of the trumpet, in any words, when the prophets start speaking the same stuff. So at the sound of a certain trumpet, the last one, this is the message that will be in the last days. Okay? For those who love end time messages. Last, end. Okay, just put it there. We're going to come back to that. He says, we shall all be changed. He says, because in Corruption will put on incorruption. And mortal will put on immortality. So there's two groups that will be in the end time. The one group is the group that are corrupt, decayed, perished. In other words, the group that already died. They decayed, they got corrupted, They perished. But there's another group that's still alive. So they are mortal. Mortal means I can die. Immortal means I cannot die. So the corrupted, those that have already died, will now put on incorruption. And the mortals will put on immortality. So I will not put on incorruption because I have not died. I will put on immortality. I cannot die. But those that have died must put on incorruption because they have died. Now they must come back to a place of life again. Come on. Corruption must put on incorruption and mortal must put on immortality. So there's a group that have died that will put on incorruption. But the group that have not died will put on undiable. (laughs) Have you got that? So we have found out that all our invitations for sinners are unscriptural. If we stick to it, we make the word of no effect. So if you stand up tonight and give another invitation in your gospel services that says, if you die tonight, you're wrong. You're not supposed to proclaim death. You're supposed to proclaim life. So if you give an invitation that involves death, you are not a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are a preacher of Adam. Because in Adam you eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and you shall die. But in Christ you eat the tree of life and you shall never die. So if you preach death, you are preaching Adam. In Adam all die, but in Christ all are made alive. So you've got to decide, are you going to stay in Adam or are you going to come in Christ? Does this offend you? Now you know the word offense. You know offense is the biggest sin. Did you know that Adam never sinned? Through one man's offense, sin entered. Romans chapter 5. It does not say through one man's sin, sin entered. Through one man's offense, sin entered. And through sin, death entered. So Adam allowed sin because he was offended. Remember Mark chapter 6. The Bible says Jesus came to his own hometown in Nazareth and he could do there no great powers because they were offended. Anybody? Remember, he could do there no great powers because the people were offended. So offense stopped the power of God. You know, 
Hosea chapter 6 says, Oh, you know, let us return to the Lord. You know, after two days He will revive us again and we will live in His presence. You know, the great revival of Scripture will come to us like the rain. But Hosea 5 ends with this. When they repent of their offense... I will return from my place on high and come and pour out my spirit. So offense is the biggest thing. Hmm? Now the scripture that uses the offense, word offense, more than any other chapter in the Bible is, are you ready? John chapter 6. They said, Moses gave us bread from heaven. Jesus says, Moses did not give you bread from heaven. He says, I am the bread that comes down from heaven. If you eat my flesh and drink my blood, now you can check it in any translation, you shall live and never die. Okay, now if you don't like the word, you've got to tear out that page because it uses the word never. Huh? If you eat the bread that comes down from heaven, you shall live and never, never, never die. <clears throat> then Jesus goes on and he says, My flesh is truly meat, and my blood is truly drink. For again I say unto you, if you eat the bread that I give you, you shall never taste death. Second time. So three times in that scripture of John 6, he says, I'm the bread. And every time he says, when you eat this, you shall never die. And every time it says, and the people were offended. Yeah, it says they were offended. Jesus asked them they were offended. And then it says again they were offended. Three times. So listen to this. So Jesus says, Are you also offended? Do you also want to go away? And Peter said, To whom shall we go? Because with you are the words of life. Now here comes the question, all you holy people. Why? Were the people offended in John 6? Because Jesus said, my body is truly meat. Because he said, eat my flesh. That's what I always thought. I always thought they were offended because it was, yuck, man, who can eat his flesh? Yuck, you know? I always thought that. Till I sat down and read John chapter 6 slowly. You know what offended them? The fact that Jesus says, you don't have to die. Because everybody is preparing to die. They were offended because of life. That's why twice Jesus said, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and life. And he said, Are you offended? You also want to go? And they said, Where shall we go? With whom shall we go? You have the words of life. So Jesus said, The offense was life, not the body eating. They were offended because Jesus said, if you come to me, you can live. Yeah. And there it says in John chapter 6, never die, never taste death, and never see death. Okay, he says you'll not see it, you'll not taste it, and you'll not have it. Okay, anybody wants to die? Come, I'll pray for you right now. Why is it that we preach death till we face death? Why is it if somebody's in an accident and they lie with heart machines, lung machines and drips, why don't we go pull out the plugs and say, let the man die? Why don't we help them to heaven? If that is our goal in the church, why don't we, if somebody gets sick, say, well, sister, you've got to praise God for the sickness. I mean, you are one step closer to death than the rest of us. Let's help you. Father, we pray that the sickness will have its due cause and kill our sister and take her to heaven. I mean, that's our goal, isn't it? 
When we give an invitation, it's, are you ready to die? Are you ready to go to heaven? So why don't we help people to go to heaven? Jesus says, go preach the gospel of the kingdom. Heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers. Raise the dead. Why do we pray for the sick? To get them healed. Why do we give an invitation if you die? So we double minded, so we don't see the true power of God. If I believe in life, it's no struggle to get the sick healed. Because I don't get them healed to die later. I want to get them healed to live. So, if you ever watch the Spirit Word channel or see any of our DVDs, I mean hundreds, literally hundreds of HIV positive people get healed. Sometimes two to three hundred in a single service. So I go to them, I don't pray for HIV. I don't ask God to set them free from HIV. I say, I command the spirit of death, go. And then I say, my dear brothers and sisters, brother, sister, or I could say, lady, sir, look at me. I bring you life. I bring you life. Have you seen it? I bring you life. Just lift them up, lift them up, lift them up. Come, look at me, sister. I bring you life. Walk. And they walk. I didn't speak to HIV, I didn't speak to the virus, I didn't speak to sickness. I spoke to death and I command life to come in. Because, see, we shall reign in life. The, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. There's another word that is used in the Gospels, as well as in the letters. Eternal life huh? you might have eternal life eternal life eternal life okay have you ever read a scripture that talks about the afterlife okay. <laughs> does jesus talk about everlasting eternal or afterlife so the idea of the church is, of eternal life is, you must first die, and then after you died, you will get eternal life. Wrong. It's not biblical. It's not scriptural. It's an idea of humanity. It's, it's traditions of men. And if we hold that, we make the word of God of no effect. So do we want the word to have an effect? Then preach life. eternal everlasting not after he who has the son has life and shall never see death why don't we quote the rest of the scripture he who has the son has life and shall never taste death Go. He didn't say, he who has the son, when he dies, he will live forever. It's not in the Bible that you die to get eternal life. You believe to get eternal life. Come on, help me. You believe to have everlasting life. If you believe, you get eternal, everlasting life. Okay. So why do people then die? So Jesus comes in John 10 verse 10 and he says a very awesome profound revelation. He says the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Okay, you all know the scripture. But come on, quote it. But I have come that you might have what? What type of life? Okay. 
So that Jesus said, I come that you might have abundant death, so that when you die, you will have eternal life. Or did he say, if you believe in me, you shall live and never die. So why do we preach death? God did not make man to die. He ate of the tree. Then God protected the tree of life, but now the tree of life is open. Who is the tree of life? The Lord Jesus Christ. So if I partake of the fruit from his lips, I will have eternal life. So why do people die? Because preachers preach death. They say it at the end of the meeting. If you die tonight, where will you spend eternity? The Bible has nothing to say about eternity. It only talks about eternal life. Everlasting life. Abundant life. Ready? Okay, so we are in John 10.10. 10. The thief comes to steal, kill and destroy. So who kills? Thief. Who gives life? Jesus. Now, who's the thief? No, it's not the devil. It's not the devil. There's nothing about the devil in John 10. John 10 doesn't refer to the devil once. Open your Bibles. There's nothing about Satan and the devil in John 10. Nothing, nothing, nothing. The word Satan and devil is not referred to in John 10. Jesus refers to the Pharisees and the rulers of the synagogue, the Jewish leaders that works with the law of Moses. Look at me. Can I jump to another scripture, come back? See, we preach a lot of stuff that's not in the Bible, but somebody that was a good man of God wrote a book and everybody believes the book. Why don't we check the book with the Bible? Not the Bible with the book. <clears throat> so listen. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. The letter, brackets, the law, kills. What kills? It's mentioned about four times there in the first few verses of 2 Corinthians 3. The letter kills. The letter kills. The letter kills. But the Spirit gives life. So the words that I speak, John 6, 63, they are Spirit and they are life. So if we believe the words of Jesus, we have life. If we believe Moses, we die. So you stupid Galatians, who have bewitched you? The witches are not the Sangomas. They just traditional healers. The witches are the people in the church that brings back the law of Moses. So he says, the thief. So that's the one, because Jesus said, all those that came before me. Now remember, he refers to the last 400 years where there was no prophets. And when there were no prophets from the time of the Babylonian captivity, there were no prophets. But the Israelites instituted for themselves synagogues that is never mentioned in the Old Testament. Rulers of the synagogue that's never mentioned in the Old Testament. Pharisees and Sadducees never mentioned in the Old Testament. It's not biblical. So Jesus says the rulers, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the synagogue people that use just the law of Moses, they came before me. They are thieves and they are robbers. Yeah. But I have come that you might have life. So if you keep on listening to them, you die. Okay. So the thief comes to steal, kill and destroy. Jesus said, the letter of the law kills. But the spirit makes alive. So who's the thief? Everybody said, Satan, the devil. It's not. 
It's not mentioned there. The thing mentioned there is the Jewish rulers that works with the law of Moses. So the letter of the law kills. So if you preach the law, you're killing your people. Brother, the word of God said, you shall not. It's law. Romans says, no one can condemn you, judge you, or bring in any accusation against you. So we don't preach sin and law. We preach righteousness and freedom from the law. We preach grace and mercy. And God will work with grace. God will work with mercy. God is not there to judge you and condemn you. God is there to give you grace and mercy. By grace are you saved. Not by condemnation. People preach the veins on their neck stands like this. And I tell you tonight, uh, if you were here, and you were here, and you were here, and people feel so wicked. Then after we've condemned them and judged them, we still present them with death. Now if you die tonight, everybody's going to be scared to die. we got to liberate them from death and bring them life. So listen to this. Lazarus is dead. The sisters are crying. Lord, if you were here, our brother would not have died. Jesus said, he shall live again. They said, oh yes, we believe he shall live in the resurrection. Jesus said, I am the resurrection. (laughs) If you believe in me, I'm the resurrection life. Though you are dead, Lazarus, yet shall you live. But those that live and believe, listen, shall never die, comma, do you believe this? Read it. John 11, verse 25 and 26. And whoever continues to live. Okay. So if you are dead and you have believed, you shall live again. But if you continue to live. And believes in, has faith in, cleaves to and relies on me. Shall never actually die at all. Do you believe this? Shall never actually die at all. Do you believe this? So Jesus said, it's easy for people to believe if you die, you live again. But what about if you live, you will never die. Do you believe this? Listen to the message. You don't have to wait for the end. I am right now, resurrection and life. The one who believes in me, even though he or she dies, will live. And everyone who lives believing me does not ultimately die at all. Do you believe this? How many love to see the sons of God manifested? I mean, we've preached it now. Uh, Creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. You know what it says in Romans 8? What will happen when the sons of God are manifested? He said, it'll be the salvation of our bodies. The Amplified says in brackets, freedom from the grave. I can just maybe read it to you. Romans 8. (laughs) Sons of God, sons of God, verse 23. And not only the creation grows, but we ourselves too, who have and enjoy the first fruits of the Spirit, a foretaste of the blissful things to come, grown inwardly as we wait for the redemption of our bodies from sensuality and from the grave, which will reveal our adoption of manifestations as sons of God. So who will be the sons of God? The people that say, we're not preaching death in the grave. We're not, we are preaching these bodies will put on immortality. We're going to be saved. Not only our spirits and our souls, but our bodies will be saved. Yes. Saved from what? Saved from death. Okay, let's go to Second Timothy, just a few scriptures.
Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life. Okay? Listen how Paul starts the letter. I'm an apostle because I must preach the promise that we have of life. Okay. So we have a promise of life. Not after life. Jump down to verse 10. It is that purpose and grace which he now has made known and has fully disclosed and made real to us through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ who annulled death. King James abolished death. I don't know what your Bible says. He annulled death. He abolished death. 2 Timothy 1 verse 10. What does your Bible say? Destroy death. Annul death. Abolish death. Listen. And made it of no effect. Come on, have you got a Bible? Made it of no effect. Are you ready? And brought life and immortality. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher. Are you appointed a preacher and apostle? Then you're supposed to preach life and immortality. How many sang a song, no matter what rhythm or what tune it had, but something to the effect of, this is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Okay, that's what we sang in the 70s. Then in the 80s, they brought another one out. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in Him. This is the day that the Lord has made. Okay, no matter how, but you've heard it somewhere. What is that day? That day is in Psalm 118 talking about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. This is the day that the Lord has made. He's talking about Christ dying on the cross. So let us rejoice and be glad in the fact that Jesus is going to die. So he's appointed to death. Do you know what it says? After we rejoice because this is the day that the Lord has made. We shall live and not die. Habakkuk has a vision. Chapter 1, he says, the burden of the prophet Habakkuk. Chapter 3 says, you know, let us write this vision to the sound of enthusiastic, triumphal music. Chapter 2, he says, write this vision down. It will tarry for a long time, but in the end, the vision will speak. What is this vision? Chapter 1, around about verse 12, I don't know. He says, this is the vision of Habakkuk. O Lord, you are from everlasting, and we shall not die. So there must be a generation of people that will not die. 1 Timothy 4, there's a good scripture for the rapture people. We shall not all die, but we shall all be changed. Those that are corrupted, the dead, will put on incorrupted. Those that are alive, will put on immortality. So, uh, what are we supposed to preach? Life and immortality. Nowhere are you you commanded to preach death. Nowhere. If you preach death, you're on the wrong side of the track. You are working with the law of Moses. You are a thief and you are a robber because the thief steals, kills and destroys. If you preach death, you are a thief. You're robbing people of their lives. You're supposed to preach Psalm 91. Nothing shall hurt you. Nothing, no evil shall come near your dwelling place. With length of days will he satisfy you. We're supposed to preach life. Heaven is not a home for people. God made the earth and put you on the earth. No, brother, the Bible says Jesus built us homes in heaven. No, there's no scripture that says he built your home in heaven. 
He says, in my father's house are many dwelling places. We discussed you, the dwelling place is you. God wants to dwell in you. So in God's house, 1 Timothy 3, 15, the house of God is the church. So in God's house are many dwelling places. I prepared for you a place so that I can dwell in you. I and the Father will come and live in you. Heaven is not mentioned in John 14. Neither is death. Neither is going away. Jesus is not building homes. He's not a building contractor. He's a savior. He saves people. I wonder how many of the stuff we believe, we preach it as the Bible, but we heard it in a song. And when we check the song out, it's not in the Bible. Did you know that the Negro people in America were always a very religious crowd? And they were the slaves in America. They had songs that they sang about their families when they were in the slave slavery in America. And the songs were like, you know, down by the riverside, down by the rivers. So there was a river where the slaves were taken over. And they sang, you know, carry me over. I will meet you at the river. I will meet you at the shore. You know, that's songs that they sang for their loved ones. But because they were a very religious crowd, they mixed it with the gospel. And they sang it in church. And people made a doctrine. That's why the Negro people still preach to you. This soulish thing of going to the other side and going to the other shore and going to the other place. That was to go to be with their loved ones that were slaves. And the church took it. Now we have big men that, you know, preach powerfully, but they mix the culture with the gospel. And we all long to get to the other side. The other side was the family that were slaves. The book that we have, the Bible, does not talk about another side and another shore and another river and crossing the river and crossing Death Jordan and crossing Death River. The Bible we have talks about, I have come that you might have life and everlasting life, eternal life, immortal life. You're supposed to preach life, present people with life. If you preach life, it's easy to get the sick healed because life conquers death. John chapter 6. The whole John 6 is bread. Jesus multiplied bread. Then the sign of the bread. You know. Okay, let's start verse 32. Jesus said, I assure you, Moses did not give you bread. But it is my Father who gives you the true heavenly bread. For the bread of God is he who comes down of heaven and gives life. To the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. If you come to me, you will never be hungry. Verse 40 This is my Father's will and His purpose that everyone who sees the Son, believes, declares to, and trusts in, and relies on Him should have eternal life. And I will raise Him up now, there at the last day. Just let's go on. Now the Jews murmured and found fault with Him. Hmm? Verse 48, I'm the bread of life that gives life. Your forefathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. But this is the bread that came down from heaven that anyone who eats it may never die. Does your Bible say that? Okay, now the church's idea was you die now, but then you live forever and don't die. Jesus didn't say, I've come to give you a breakable life. We break it on this side and continue it on the other side. He said, I've come to give you everlasting. Everlasting means it's unbreakable. I myself am the living bread, verse 51, that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats of this bread will live forever. Verse 54, he who feeds on my flesh and drink my blood has, possesses now eternal life. Verse 58, this is the bread that came down from heaven. It is not like the manna which our forefathers ate and died. He who takes this bread for his food shall live forever. 
verse 60. When his disciples heard this, many of them said, this is hard and difficult, strange, and it's offensive. It's an unbearable message. Verse 63, Jesus said, it's the spirit who gives life. The words that I speak are spirit and life. 68, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. In the night the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. Listen. He broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Eat it. And every time you eat it, you call me in remembrance that I died for you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Drink it. And every time you proclaim my death till I come. Till I come. He who eats this bread and drinks this cup unworthily, not discerning that this is the Lord's body. John chapter 6, this is my body. If you eat my flesh. 1 Corinthians 11, if you do not discern that this is my body, you will bring judgment over yourself. But he who judge himself and then partake discerning that this bread is his body and this cup is his blood. Are you ready? He says, that is why many are weak, many are sick, and quite enough have died. Jesus says back to John 6 if you eat this bread and drink this blood you will never die you don't have to be sick you don't have to be weak you can be strong you can be healthy and you can live forever because Jesus is coming back again you got to eat this bread till I come what happens when he comes he brings the dead with him What's going to happen to them? They're going to be changed from corruption to incorruption. What's going to happen to us? We're going to be changed from mortal to immortality. If the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, he will quicken your mortal body. You are supposed to be quickened. You are supposed to put on immortality. You are supposed to live forever. You're not supposed to die. You are undiable. You are incomparable. You are indestructible. I mean, you've got life, the God kind of glory life that we preached the last tonight. You can live and not die. Yeah.